Amen. All right, tonight, Genesis chapter number 41. Uh, this is a very interesting chapter. It's packed full, and as you can see, it's a very long chapter. Uh, last week, we were in Genesis 40, which dealt with the, uh, the dreams of the cupbearer of Pharaoh, and then also the chief baker. So it was the, uh, the chief of the stewards who was the cupbearer, and the chief baker had dreams. They were thrown into prison previously. Obviously, Joseph was also in prison, and this gave the opportunity for Joseph to be able to interpret these dreams. Of course, God gave them the dreams, and he's going to work everything together for good. Um, after the, the dreams came to fruition, which was the... Uh, the chief baker was put to death, and then with the the um, chief cup, the cupbearer, which was the chief steward, that man re was restored unto his place. Joseph had told him, "Hey, remember me when you go to Pharaoh," and he had completely forgotten about it. That right now is where we pick up here in verse number one. We're going to dive right in, big chapter. So let's get started. Verse number one it says, "And it came to pass at the end of two full years." that Pharaoh dreamed. So this is two years after that man was restored unto his office. So this means that Joseph was in jail or in prison technically for two more additional years after this had taken place. So it says this again, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind. Now kind there means cow basically. It's plural. It's speaking of multiple, right? So there's multiple cows. So they're well favored means, they're, means that they are well to look upon, right? They're good to look at. They're healthy is what it's talking about. Look at what it says next. And fat flesh. So they're not thin. There's a lot of meat on them, right? They're, they're, they're ripe. They're ready to be eaten. They're, they're, they have a lot of good meat on them. They're not thin and skinny and they're not sickly. And then it says this, and they fed in a meadow. Look at verse 3. And behold, seven other kinds. So there, now these are seven additional cows. So there was seven, of course, that were healthy and full. Now there are seven more, it says. Seven other kinds, separate, came up after them out of the river. Now notice what it says. Ill-favored and lean flesh. Now ill, of course, means sickly. And lean means like thin or skinny, saying they don't have a lot of meat on their bones, right? They're very sickly and they're very thin. Look at what it says next. It says, and stood by the other kind. So they're, they're feeding together. And stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And we're told that, that this is located um, uh, inside of a meadow. So the meadow is located at the brink of the river. Remember the first seven were feed, it says they fed in a meadow, right? So this meadow must be right there at the brink of the river. Then it says this in verse 4. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind, so the sickly cows, did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. That had to be a dream. So these other seven like sickly cows just start just like devouring the seven you know, well-favored and fat flesh Kind. And I'm sure it was very realistic. I'm sure it was a very bizarre thing. It was probably startling and bothered him when he woke up. Look at what it says next. Verse 5. And he slept, so he fell back to sleep. And dreamed the second time. So this is an, a, another dream. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one. Uh, I'm sorry. Seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk. Rank and good. Saying it's tall and it's good. Verse 6. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprang up after them. So there are two sets of seven again. One is, again, healthy. It, is, uh, it says rank and good, saying it's good to look at, well favored, right? It, it, uh, and then the other seven that come up are thin. Basically the exact same thing that we saw with the kind, right? With the cows. They're very thin. There's not much to them. They're probably very unhealthy looking. It says thin ears and blasted with the east wind. What does that mean, blasted with the east wind? It means it's being, it's being pushed to and fro because it's so thin. It's, it's not able to stand up on its own. It's being blasted with the east wind when the wind blows because it's so thin and skinny. It's not even able to stand up, right? It says blasted with the east wind. It says sprung up after them. So these seven came up after them. Notice that there's an order here, and that's obviously relevant. We're going to see that in a moment. The seven good ones come first, and then the seven bad. Just like with the cows, the seven good come first, and then the seven bad. Look again, verse uh, uh, 7. And the seven thin ears 
devour the seven rank, that means tall, like I said, and full ears. So notice it's full. You know, it, 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 there's a lot there to it, right? It's, it's healthy. Then it says, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So he dreamed, he woke up again after this dream. And again, uh, as, as just like what happened with the kind, the seven, you know, uh, sickly ears ate. They devoured the other seven. That's why I used the word devoured the first time, because it uses the word devour the second time. You can see these are, of course, parallels with one another, right? So the seven sickly ears of corn, the seven, you know, uh, uh, small and thin ears of corn, they ate up the tall and rank and healthy ears of corn. The same exact thing that happened with the kind. Look at verse number eight now. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you've read all the way through, specifically if you've read the book of Daniel, something almost identical happens with Nebuchadnezzar, where he has a dream and it troubles him. It says his spirit was troubled, it bothered him, right? He needs an interpretation to that dream and then he ends up calling Daniel. Daniel and Joseph are very similar in extremely, in so many different ways. They're both in a secular kingdom, a kingdom of pagans. They both end up being exalted very highly. Uh, there's so many different parallels. They both have the, uh, uh, the gift of being able to interpret dreams. They're both men of God. They're both very hard workers and they're, they're constantly both being talked about, uh, about how well they work. As well, there's a lot of parallels between uh, Daniel and uh, Joseph. Not only that, Daniel is exalted to uh, the the second highest position in the kingdom, and we'll see that Joseph here in just a few minutes, same exact thing happens. The almost the exact same language even that happens with uh, Daniel happens with Joseph as well. Look at. Um, Verse number 8, again, so it says this, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Every time I read this verse, I always think about how this is like the wisdom of the world. And what does the Bible say that it is? It's foolishness with God. It's foolishness. So they call all the wise. He gets all the wisest men in his kingdom, the magicians. This is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does as well. He calls the astrologers, the soothsayers. He calls everyone that he possibly can. It says magicians, just everyone. He brings them all in. He t and, and in that case, he doesn't even remember his dream, right? He tells him, hey, tell me my dream and tell me the interpretation thereof. And everybody's like, nobody can do this, right? You know, we've been faking it all along, basically. That was what was going on. So, in this case, it calls all the wise men in, and nobody can, nobody can interpret the dream. Not one person can interpret the dream. You know what it is? You gather all the, the wisdom of the world together, all the philosophers of the United States of America, all these guys you know, that everybody loves to hear talk, you know, even, even these guys that would be considered conservatives, Ben Shapiro, you know, Jordan Peterson, all of these idiots... Their wisdom is foolishness with God. They don't impress God. It's foolishness when it comes to the Bible. They defy the wisdom of the Bible all the time. You know what they sound like? They sound like a stinking fool. That's what they sound like. Because this is true wisdom right here, my friend. This is true wisdom right here. And just like we saw there, he gathers all the wise men together. They don't help him at all. They don't help him even a, even, even a tiny bit. And that's what you have Christians today even are seeking after the wisdom of the world. And trying to get answers. But let me just go ahead and tell you right now. They have no answers. They don't have the answers. You know what you need to go to is you need to go to the Word of God. You need to go to a church and hear the Word of God preached. You know, from a pastor, you need to get the Word of God and read it for yourself. That, this is true wisdom. This is where we find real and true wisdom. Look at what it says in verse number 9. It says, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. It's funny how he, he remembers this after, too. He calls all these people. He has a dream. You'd think that that'd be pretty profound in your memory that some guy's able to, like, interpret your dream for you and then it comes true. I can't imagine how somebody could forget that. Like, I do remember my faults this day. You know, there was this guy this one time, you know, when I was in prison, right? I'm a little skeptical of the chief butler. I don't know if you can tell from last week as well whether or not this is... I don't know if this is sincere or not. I hope that it is, but he says... I do remember my faults this day. Right? He says, uh, verse 10, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward. Obviously, that's prison. 
Put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And like I mentioned, because they were more prestigious in the kingdom, they were put in the guard's uh, uh, house, the captain of the guard's house, and that's why Joseph took care of them, everything. They, they received special treatment while in prison. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. <clears throat> Verse 13, And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office... Right? He's back there bearing the cup again. The exact amount of days and everything. I mean, very exact, very precise. And then he says this, uh, And him he hanged. Talking about the chief baker. Remember he said after three days, he has the three baskets on the top that was full of flesh, and then the birds came. And the birds, of course, represented him while after he was dead or while he's even hanging and alive. His hands are strapped down. The birds are coming. It's a horrible, horrible thought to envision, but they're coming and just plucking at him. You know, and plucking his eyes out probably. And that's what that represented. And uh, we see that those came true, and now he's reflecting back upon that. He's telling Pharaoh about it right now. Look at verse uh, 14 now. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily, so that means like fast, they hurried, out of the dungeon. It says, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. So he shaves himself, so of course before he's going to go in and he's going to stand before Pharaoh, who's the king, he's referred to as a, as a king as well uh, uh, in previous chapters. He's gonna make, they're going to make sure that he's presentable. So they first, they take him and they, they, they have him shave, <coughs> excuse me, they change his raiment, and then he's brought in. There's, of course, symbolism here as well. Uh, you know, before we're, we, um, you know, are, are stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we're given new raiment, aren't we? Look at what it says there in verse number 15. And Pharaoh, uh, I'm sorry, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Now, is that true? In, in, in a very specific way that he worded that? Technically, no. Because this is exactly, if you remember, what the chief butler and what the baker said. When he went to him, hey, you know, he's like, uh, what's wrong with you? Ask him, why, why look he so sad today, right? And then they respond, hey, we've dreamed a dream and there's no uh, interpreter of it. What does Joseph say? Do not interpretations belong to God? What is he saying? I, don't, I can't interpret it, but hey, here, let, allow God to interpret this dream, and then I'll tell you what it says. He's the messenger. So that's what, notice that's what, uh, so here, um, Pharaoh is, is under the assumption that Joseph personally is the one that is doing this, right? He says, I, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> and Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. Notice the humility. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. That's the attitude we should have, right? Of course, the Spirit of God is what was allowing him to be able to do this. But any, any skills that we have, you know, when it comes to spiritual gifts, we need to always make sure that we give God the credit for them. You need to remember where you were before you started serving God and you know how you were down and out. You didn't know anything about the Bible. God is who got you where you are today. God is the one that enabled you to be able to understand the Bible. You see people that aren't saved and they try to sit down and study the Bible. They don't understand anything. So many people come up with crazy you know, interpretation of the Bible. Even salvation, which is just so basic and so easy. It's spelled out so clearly in the Bible. They try to sit down and read the Bible. They can't understand even a lot of very simple things. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables us to be able to understand the Bible. Just something so simple. Even just the knowledge from the Word of God to begin with comes from the God enabling us or the gift of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, right? So we need to make sure that we always give God the credit. Just like Joseph, he makes sure he corrects them. He said, hey, I heard say of thee that thou canst interpret dreams. And he's like, it is not in me. Think about that, the humility there. It's not in me. And look what he says next. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 17, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, 
And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat and fat fleshed and well favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill favored and lean flesh. Notice that time he added the word poor. Keep reading. Such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. So he's saying they're in very bad shape. They're very unhealthy is the point. Verse 20. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. Verse 21. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them up, but they were still ill-favored. As at the beginning, so I woke. We're given a little bit more additional information here as well. Notice that's interesting. It says that after the seven, that looks like a horse flying around, doesn't it? It keeps catching people's eyes because that fly is like that big. It's the size of a penny. Um, but you know, notice that there, there, there's two sets of these seven cows, and there's this sickly set that's just like as skinny as a stick. And then there's these other seven over here that are fat flesh, and they're big, and they're healthy. The seven sickly ones, the ill-favored, the, the, that are poor for, you know, the, 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 he says, he uses the word badness. They're very unhealthy. They eat up these big, healthy, fat ones. But then he says, even after they ate them, they're just standing there and they look exactly the same. They're still super thin. They're still very ill-favored and they're still sickly and poor and, you know, they're, they're, they don't look any healthier, right? They haven't gained any weight. They still just look bad to eat, right? They don't look healthy. And then it says, he awoke. Verse 22. And I saw in my dream. So here's, he's going to tell the second dream. Remember, he dreamed twice. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk. So this is one stalk. Seven ears come up. This is all the same. It says, full and good. So they're full. There's a lot of weight to them. There's a lot there, right? They're healthy. Verse 23, And behold, seven ears withered, thin and blasted with the east wind, sprang up after them. And the, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. Verse 25, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. I'm sure Pharaoh at this point starts to at least have a little bit of peace after he's been seeking an answer for this. You know, it says his spirit was troubled. This could have been, even, even his spirit being troubled could have been from God because, of course, the dream was sent from God in the first place. And he's seeking an answer. The magicians are no good. You know, just like today, and he, all the people of the other religions, the, the, the rabbis, you know, uh, uh, just all the spiritual leaders of the priests, any of them, they're no good. And he finally adds a man of God, a man that actually worships the true God, Jehovah, comes to him, and then he's able to declare it to him. And he tells him, and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the, and listen to the, the, the assertiveness, he just tells him right off the bat, the dream of Pharaoh is one. So I'm sure there was peace when he just starts interpreting the dream for him. Right? God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 26, the seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. The dream is one. One in essence. No, I'm just kidding. I know people are out there thinking that, right? Now, he's saying it's the same exact dream, right? <laughs> Look at verse 27. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind. And it said, blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. So, he's explaining that these two dreams, they represent the exact same thing. They represent the exact same thing of what God is about to do. And he showed unto Pharaoh uh, what he is about to do, right? So this is a divine dream that was given directly to Pharaoh. Keep reading. Look at uh, verse 29. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. So there's great plenty. That means the land's going to be very fruitful, right? It's going to bring forth fruit. <clears throat> They're going to have an abundance of food and, and resources and all different types of things. That's what the fat flesh kind represented. And that's what the full rank and good ears of corn represented in the, the one stalk that came up. Okay, now look at verse number... 30, and there shall arise after them 
seven years of famine. So the next seven kind that came up that are ill, that are, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were for badness to look at, they were very sickly looking, right? They represented famine. Just like the other ears of corn that came up um, and it, they were blasted with the east wind, they represented famine. So keep reading there. It says, And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. So notice it's very interesting that when uh, Pharaoh gives you his dream from his perspective, there's an additional point that is given in his dream that was not given the first time we read it. And it was that after the seven kind that were ill-favored, they were sickly looking, right? They were, they, it says that they were lean-fleshed. It says they were ill-favored and lean-fleshed, right? After they had eaten the well-favored and fat-fleshed, what did he say? How did they look? Did they, did they all of a sudden, you know, uh, gain all of this nutrition and protein and get strong and get big and fat-fleshed? No. It obviously doesn't make any sense, but they were still ill-favored. They were still very thin. They were still very sickly. They were still very unhealthy, right? Well, that wasn't given to you the first time when the dream was, was explained, right? When the Holy Spirit explained the dream to you, uh, or just detailed what took place in this dream. But then Pharaoh gives you this little nugget. Well, right here we're told what that represents. If you would have been paying attention, it says, And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. So what it represented was the fact that it's going to be so bad that that seven, all that, 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 that fat fleshed, it's not even going to matter when those seven years of famine come. It's not going to help those seven years of famine at all. Just like the, the fat flesh didn't help the, the uh, lean fleshed cows at all. That's what that represents. So it's important to pay attention. But even when Pharaoh, he gives you a, little, a special little nugget there. When you, uh, if you make sure you, you pay attention both times it's told. Because you notice when you read that, it was almost verbatim the same, right? You can feel like, man, this is a waste of time. The Bible repeats things for a reason. I'm actually going to point something out about that right now. Look at verse, um, verse 30. We'll finish reading that. It says, And the famine shall consume the land. So this is going to be very grievous. This is going to be very strong. Right? It's going to be, it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, it's going to hurt the land. Very damaging to the land and to Egypt. Right? It says, <clears throat> shall consume the land. Look at verse 31. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following. So you're not even going to remember those days. It's not going to help at all, right? Because of how bad the famine is. So the famine, it sounds like, is going to be much, much worse than how you know, fruitful and plenteous the land was previous. And it says this, verse 31, pay close attention to this. I'm going to tie something in with verse 32. It says, for it shall be very grievous. So it's going to be very grievous, right? It's going to be very damaging. Uh, look at verse 32. And for that, notice that. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. So because of the significance, because of, of how bad this is actually going to be, God gave him the dream two different times. Now, that's very interesting because we can get into how God operates, right? We can, we can understand of how God will, will give a message. What will he do? If something is very important, what will he do? He'll give it twice. A lot of people, when you read the Bible, they, 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 one thing that you'll, it, will, it can throw you off right when you start reading the Bible. It's very different about this piece of literature than other uh, uh, pieces of literature, whether it be religious or not, just everything. Is the Bible does something that not a lot of things do, and that is that it repeats itself very, very often. Like Jesus, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. What's he doing? He's literally saying the same thing over three times, just in three different ways, right? Just like shepherd and bishop, right? So I just thought of that. But look at what it says next. I want you to notice this. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It says, it is because the thing is established by God. So notice when, when it comes from God, this is how God operates. God is the one that gave this to him. Uh, when I read this and, and, uh, and really stuck out to me and I noticed that he had, he, how he explained to us why God repeated it twice, then I started thinking about all the things that are repeated in the Bible twice. And I'll give you a perfect example. What in the Bible as far as plagues and things is going to be like the most grievous ever? What would you say? Book of Revelation. Is that what somebody said? The book of Revelation. Guess how many times you're told the story? Twice. Isn't that interesting? Why? 
Because it will be very grievous. Because it will be very grievous. And you're told different angles. And what is it about when you're reading through the book of Revelation? I mean, it is about how grievous it is. Like, it is going to be the worst. I mean, the Bible tells you that over and over again. That there, there has never been such a time in the past nor ever will, will be to come. Like it will be the worst, you know, uh, uh, you know um, plagues and, and it'll be more hurtful. More people will be killed. I mean, it will be catastrophic on a, on a, a macro level. The entire world will be affected just in a major way like it's never been before. And we're told the story from God in the book of Revelation. John receives a vision, if, if you will, because he's a seer, of course, and he sees the vision two times. Why? Makes perfect sense. That's how God operates. Why? Because it will be very grievous. He wants to repeat it twice. He wants to make sure that he gets the point across. Why did God give this dream twice to Pharaoh? Because it's going to be very grievous. He wanted him to understand the significance of how bad this is really going to be. Look at what it says there at the end of verse 32. I don't believe I read that last statement. So first it says, It is because the thing is established by God. And then it says, And God will shortly bring it to pass. So notice this is coming shortly. Also we get an idea of, of, of uh, in this case, of uh, how long this is going to be. Uh, in, in this situation, what is it? It's seven years until uh, the next, until the famine actually begins. So that's quite a ways off and he says here it's shortly bring it to pass. You can compare numbers and stuff in the book of Ezekiel. It's similar. God will send Ezekiel to go preach and I believe it was quite a few years before the, the punishment actually came. Look at verse 33. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Notice that this is still, this is still coming from God. This is Joseph speaking right now and he is, is giving advice or he is speaking right now, I believe, by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Because he was sent here for this very reason. I want you to understand that, that everything that happened... God was the one that is bringing this to pass. He gave the dream to the chief butler and to the chief baker so that Joseph could interpret it, restore the butler to his office, Pharaoh would have his dream, and then the butler could say, hey, I know a guy that interprets dreams. And then he could go and get Joseph, and now Joseph is speaking by the Holy Spirit and he is telling Pharaoh what he should do. This was God's plan all along because right now we're getting, we're getting ready to see Joseph exalted to being second in the kingdom here in just a moment. So notice what it says. I have to hit on this for a second. It says, verse 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and it says, and set him over the land of Egypt. That's God's plan. I want you to notice that. That's important. Set him over the land of Egypt. Doesn't that sound familiar? Look at what it says next too. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. It's always, God's system is always the same. That's what I'm pointing out. His, when God sets up an authority structure, when he's going to install a, an authority structure, you know what he does? He sets a man over at the top, over everyone, as a shepherd or a bishop or an overseer, a guide, an overseer, a ruler, right? And then he sets officers underneath that, that man you know, is, is in charge of, right? That man is in charge. It's just, it's logically, it's the only system that ever works. Any secular company that ever, you know, really thrives, they always have a guy at the top. Even you look at McDonald's, there's always one person that's like, he's the boss. If you go to, the, if you go to McDonald's and you're not happy with your, what do they call the, the nuggets? A McNugget? Is that what it's called? Everything's a Mc something, isn't it? Is it a McNugget? You order a McNugget and you're like, I don't like this McNugget. Let me, you know, let me talk to your boss. And they'll bring out a boss. Then what do you say? I don't like your attitude. Let me talk to your boss. And then they bring out another boss, right? And the buck always stops somewhere. They'll bring out five people. Can I help you? No, there's, there's always an authority chain that leads to the top where there's one person there. That is the system that works. When God installs, when God implemented the system for a family, it's not husband and wife 50-50. As far as decision making and authority, what is it? It's the man is the head of the household, right? The man is every single time. You look at the Levites, there's a chief of the chiefs. What does that mean? That there's other chiefs under them. So if you back up and you go to the singers, you go to the Kohathites, guess what? There's chiefs of those. So there's a chief of the Kohathites where it ends with one guy standing there and, say, and he's the overseer of all these other people. 
all the vessels, all those things. There's one branch of the Levites where there's one guy at the top. Every time! You can go through all of them, but then guess what? Then there's Eleazar, who's the chief of the chiefs. Every time. This is how God operates every single time. He always sets a man. God says, hey, Joseph, you know, obviously he's not speaking to Joseph, but this is how God operates in this situation. He gives the, 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 the word of God through Joseph. Joseph speaks, and, and Joseph is speaking God's plan to make an authority structure. Why is he setting you know, Joseph up in this situation? What's the reason if you really think about it? He's instituting a system. He's instituting a system and an authority structure because there's going to be operations that need to take place, isn't there? There's a, there is mass operations that are getting ready to take place where they are getting ready to take a fifth, a fifth of all the corn, which is just grain of the bread, a fifth of all the grain of every person and put it in storehouses. That's a mass operation. Don't overlook that. Of all of the Egyptians, the entire nation. And God is instituting a system that works. That's what's happening right now. You know what he does? He puts Joseph at the top of the system. He put, it's just because he's a type. It's just because like Joshua, he's a type. God's not doing things that are not practical. Okay, that's silly. Yeah, he's a type, but guess what? He's doing something that's practical. Right? That works. That's why he's doing this. So he, he, he chooses out and he says, this is the type of system I want. And it's not a democracy. It's not, you know, a panel of five, six, seven people. It's not nine elders that are all just debating about what they're going to do and they can never decide. That's not what it is. The officers go to Joseph and Joseph says, do this and don't do that. That's, that's how it works. There has to be a boss like that. My company works that way and so does yours, wherever you work. That's how it works. That is the system that works. And this is a pattern from, from God. God is the one that instituted a system like this. So notice what he says. One more time. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise. <clears throat> is the exact um, explanation that is given of Daniel, by the way. So that's another parallel there. And set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So... They're taking one-fifth of all of the grain that everyone brings in in the entire land. They're going to uh, um, you know, make them bring that to them, and they're going to put it into storehouses. Read the next verse there, verse 35. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the city. So this is going to be within the cities where the, 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 more, the nobles and things like that dwell, like, like Joseph, all the officers, the Egyptians... All of them, the more nobles of the Egyptians. This is where they live in the cities and there will be storehouses there, barns, right, basically. And they're going to take this one-fifth one of every person for seven years while they're having this mass, you know, just, just fruitful and plenteous years. They're going to carry the one-fifth and put it into these storehouses as a reserve, of course, for the latter, you know, seven years are going to come. That is, is a great famine. Now notice it said corn there. Look at the end of, of chapter 41. Look at um, verse number, where's it at? 54, it says this. And the seven years of dearth began to come. Dearth just means famine. Dearth comes from the word death because famine is very grievous. People die, right? So that's what the word dearth comes from. It, it, means, it means famine, but it's referring to, it derives from death because people die during famines. According as Joseph had said, and the dearth was, was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, watch this, there was bread. There was bread. Notice that. Where did the bread come from? It came from the corn. Because what is corn? It's just like Jesus said, if a, wheat, if a corn of wheat fall to the ground, right? He talks about a corn of wheat. It just means grain. So obviously in that case it means a grain of wheat. So when they talk about corn here, it's talking about uh, grain is what it's talking about. And that's also what the, when it talks about an ear of corn in the dream, that's of course wheat as well. It's just using the word corn. Corn is a word that is used more so when it's referring to it, it being in a raw state, right? It's not planted yet, it's still a seed. That is the word that is used when it's referring to the seed of bread. <clears throat> Verse 36, And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine. So they're storing it away. It's a reserve, like I said. 
which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. So they thought that it was a very good idea. It was a good plan that he had put forth, right? So he agreed with it. And it says in verse 38, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? So he knows that... The, that He's not just speaking of himself. Man, I just spit all over. He's not just speaking of himself, is he? He can tell that the Spirit of God is in him, right? And that's why he's a prophet, because that's what a prophet does. Look, look at the next verse. It says this, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. So this plan was set up from the beginning. This is so that uh, God can promote uh, Joseph through this, uh, um, this, this circumstance and promote him to second in the kingdom. Um, keep reading there, verse number 40, it says, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So, right here we're going to start seeing some very strong typology. This is of, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, oftentimes in the Bible, God will use things um, that are, are uh, uh, parallels, they're parables, they're, they're uh, similitudes like the Bible uses the word, or metaphors, analogies, whatever you want to call them, of things that sometimes you would think is, that's kind of unexpected, right? Uh, so in this case, Pharaoh obviously is representing God. He's representing like God the Father in heaven. So oftentimes the Bible will do things like this. And I'll give you another example of this. Um, Romans chapter number 5, if you want to read it later, actually shows how Adam is a type of Christ through condemning the entire world. Through his sin, he's a type of Christ. Because it goes on to explain to you, just as Adam condemned the whole world, so also did Christ save the whole world. So it's saying that he is a type in the way, Adam is a, he, you know, uh, the negative side, he represents the negative side because he damned everyone, basically. Every single person. Well, Jesus is the second Adam, and he saved, saved every single person. You, uh, you also have a lion, which is represented as who sometimes? Who, you go ahead and tell me. What would you say? The devil. Who else does it represent? Right, exactly. You know, he's talking about being the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So, Jesus and the devil, both represented by a lion, right? So, God will do this because it's, you know, people get too carried away. It's just an analogy, right? It's, that thing is going to pick up a kid here in a minute and pull him away, right? Everybody, I see everybody just watching those flies. Yeah, but so sometimes people get too carried away with a parable that isn't just, there's little things in the parable that don't work out just right. You know, it's a parable. Not every, he's using things that are like, and what he's trying to get a certain point apart, so uh, across, he's trying to get a certain point across. So what he does is he finds something that is a very good example of that, that has a very good example of that. And he uses that, but guess what? All the other stuff doesn't line up. If you start trying to, even the parables that Christ tells and the things that he you know, uses as analogies, even while he was on this earth, if you start trying to pick every single angle and every single you know, aspect of it apart, you'll notice a lot of it won't line up directly with what he's using it as because that's not the point in the first place. You know, it lines up perfectly in one way with the point that he wants to get across. So that's how it works. So here Pharaoh is actually a picture of God the Father. When Joseph, as we've already seen, is a picture of who? Strong picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what it just said there, what Pharaoh said to Joseph. It'd be like God the Father speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Turn with me to John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. Isn't that exactly what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ? God the Father appointed that the man, Christ Jesus, would be, he would be, number one, he would rule over all of his house, right? What is his house? Think of the church. Who's the head of the church? Christ, of course, right? <clears throat> He gave all authority unto Christ as well. Look at John 12, 48. I want to point out something specific here, and we're going to go to some other verses too. It says this, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. And then he says this. Notice how he says this, a little point for in the Trinitarian aspect. He says, hath one that judgeth him. 
Now, you know, as somebody who's an Orthodox or Catholic Trinitarian, they'd say, see, he's got one that judges them. That's God the Father. See how he kind of says it as it seems like he's speaking of someone else? But he says this, hath one that judgeth him. And then he says this, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Who's it sound like he's going to judge him? The Lord Jesus Christ. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him. So who's the one that judges him? Himself. The one that's speaking it. I mean, goodness sakes. Look at, um, uh, go to John chapter number 3, verse number 35. I'm going to read to you from uh, verse 41. Genesis 41, 41. It's the very next verse. It says this, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. So notice, he has all power. He's reigning over all the land of Egypt, right? John chapter number 3, verse number 35. Let me get there myself. John chapter number 3. Verse number 35 reads, <clears throat> The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into His hand. Doesn't that sound familiar? Go to uh, Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 28. <clears throat> Look at <clears throat> verse number um, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So we can see here that what is happening with Pharaoh giving all power unto Joseph is actually a picture of God the Father giving all power unto the man Christ Jesus. That's why it's interesting as well where Pharaoh says, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Saying he gave everything. It's all up to, to, to Joseph, right? And then he says this, Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And if you think about when Jesus makes these statements, and, and uh, of course Orthodox Trinitarians or Catholic Trinitarians will, will cling on to these statements. They love these statements because these statements belittle the Lord Jesus Christ from their perspective, really is what it does. They're trying to, to make him inferior to God the Father. They'll look at the, the statements where Jesus says, you know, my father is greater than I, right? And they'll say, see, you know, the second person of the Trinity, like in his deity, they, they're, they're, they're saying. They're not saying. They're not saying that this relates to his humanity. They're saying in his deity, in, in, in all of eternity, right? That it's basically this, he's less God than God the Father. I mean, what makes him powerful? Isn't it the fact that he is deity in the first place? So they say that, you know, in his deity is what they're teaching. In the Trinity, he is greater. God the Father is greater than the Son. But this is easily explained by, of course, his humanity. That one and only true God was in heaven. And he came down to this earth through his word. The word was made flesh, right? The word of God, the one and only true God. In the Old Testament, he said, I am alone, right? Maybe that guy. He comes down to the earth and he is born on this earth as a man. And when he did so, he took upon himself limitations as a man. And that's why Hebrews chapter number 2 tells us very plainly what Jesus meant. It tells us in Hebrews chapter number 2 that he was made a little lower than the angels. And what is it talking about when it says he was made a little lower than the angels? It talks about that he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Saying that he became a man. So he was made a little lower than the angels. What did, what did Christ mean when he said, my father is greater than I? Did not Jesus have limitations while he was on this earth? And these were limitations that he did not previously have, did he? As God in heaven. Right? So, of course, God on the throne would be greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. What does Pharaoh say in that passage? He says, only on the throne, throne am I greater than thou. Notice that. Like a reference to maybe while the man Christ Jesus is living on the earth, while he's on the throne in heaven, and while he's living on the earth as a man, of course he would be greater because he was made a little lower than the angels, right? Uh, go to Ephesians 1. I believe there's another one in Ephesians chapter number 1 <clears throat> that speaks of this. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 1, towards the end of the chapter. I have the wrong verse written down here, but it's at the very end of the chapter. Look at uh, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ, talking about God the Father, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only, excuse me, in this world, but also in that which is to come. Watch this. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things. 
uh, to the church. So notice that. He's the head of all things over the church. Uh, one, once more, uh, Genesis 41 verse 40 said this. He says, Thou shalt be over my house. Notice that. That's, that's such strong parallel with God the Father exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Go back to Genesis chapter number 41. Genesis chapter number 41, we're going to begin reading uh, uh, in verse number 42 now. I already read to you verse 41. Verse 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Verse 43, and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. I believe that this is symbolism of him being at the right hand of the Father. It says, and they cried before him, this is interesting, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. So keep your hand here, obviously, in our text, and go to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. This is, of course, you know, uh, symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it says that they are all going to bow to him. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That's going to be important in a minute. Notice he gave him a name, right? <clears throat> verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So notice that everyone, because that, God the Father exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone's going to bow to him. Notice the same thing with Pharaoh. Because that he exalted Joseph, everyone's going to bow to him. So notice the strong symbolism here of the Lord Jesus Christ and Joseph. Go back to Genesis chapter 41. <clears throat> Verse 44. And, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. That's again him giving all power to Joseph, it's almost like it, uh, 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 the, a picture of how they can't get to Pharaoh without Joseph. Because he's like, I am Pharaoh, but without you, nobody can do anything. So it's just like Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. When he's speaking about what? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's the same symbolism where he's like, hey, I'm Pharaoh, but nobody can do anything without you. So if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. It's perfect symbolism here. Keep reading there in verse number uh, 45. This is also very interesting. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah. Now, what did, Jesus, what did it say about Jesus in Philippians 2? It said, And God hath given him a name which is above every name. So notice, what did Pharaoh do here? Being, symboliz being uh, symbolic of God the Father. He gave him a new name, didn't he? He gave uh, Joseph a new name, symbolizing God the Father giving Jesus his name. <clears throat> it says, uh, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went, went out over all the land of Egypt. Watch this, verse 46. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. How old was the Lord Jesus Christ when he began his ministry? 30, it's just like every verse. Boom, 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 boom. <clears throat> and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. That's like him beginning his ministry, right? It's the very beginning of when he's been instituted into this office, right? And this is, it's just like when Jesus was baptized, you know, that's basically him beginning his ministry, beginning his office. Um, it says in, uh, where, do we, where do we stop? Verse 46. Yeah, and verse 47 now. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. So there's a lot of food it's saying, right? There's, there's, there's a plethora. There's more than what they need. There's excess. Verse 48, And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. So there's tons of it, right? Very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. So it was so much they couldn't even count. He started to count it and it got to be to where he just couldn't even count it. It's so much coming in all the time. It's so much, uh, um, you know, uh, grain. Verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. Verse 51, And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he, 
hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. We can learn from that is the great joy that children bring. Notice he say, he say, I, I've forgotten all of my sadness. I've forgotten all of my heartache. Why? Because he has this child. He's saying God hath, you know, God hath caused them to do this, but it's speaking about also the blessing of having a child. Keep reading the next verse there. It says, verse 52, In the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That's also interesting. It, it, it ties back in with that phrase that we kept seeing when Joseph was put in prison. What did it say? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. We saw that coming up after it would tell you about some kind of tribulation or trial or affliction. How, you know, something... It, it, right when it begins talking about when he's in Egypt, he's in a foreign land, he's been sold into slavery, he's working and laboring, you know, in a foreign land. It tells you right, right after it gives you the context, it says, but the Lord was with him. Then, at the end, you know, it's, he starts to excel right after that. He starts to excel, he's promoted, he's doing great, things look like, seem like they're looking up. But then, of course, you know, uh, the terrible thing happens with Potiphar's wife where she falsely accused him and he's thrown in prison. He's put back in prison and then things look terrible again. You know what the Bible says again? But the Lord was with him. This ties in with that. It says that he hath made him fruitful in his afflictions. You know, oftentimes people, when they backslide, is down, is, is, as far as spiritually, it's when they're having, you know, bad things happen to them. Because it'll get people out of church. It causes people to be discouraged. But... Not only can, can, can you, you know, not, you shouldn't have, let me word it this way. You shouldn't allow those things to get you down. You should use those things to cause you to be even more fruitful. Because two outcomes can come about after, out of that. Number one, you can allow it to get you down and you can backslide and become worse of, a, worse of a Christian. Or you can use it to motivate you. And oftentimes, very often in the Bible, when people are being afflicted, like the Christians in the book of Acts... The Word of God spreads everywhere. And, there, and, and the, you know what happens is? The Word of God is just extremely fruitful. You know, the Bible says, it, Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Tribulation and affliction can bring about great fruit. You can use that affliction, or you can use that those problems in your life to motivate you to do more things for God, and to bring you closer to God. You know, if you, you can use these times to trust Him more. You have a problem in your life that maybe you've never dealt with before and you maybe feel insecure about it. Like I preached the sermon, tell it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus and trust Him that He is going to get you through. And when He does, your faith will be even that much stronger once you get through that affliction. You know, the Bible talks about the trying of your faith, right? It's, it, the Bible talks about repeatedly how, you know, uh, um, you know, God will put us through trials so that He can purify us and He can bring us out as gold. You know, all, this particular affliction and trial and these tribulations that were brought upon Joseph made Joseph into a man that he never would have been if it wasn't for what happened to him. With slavery, with all the bad things that, that, that took place, it made him that much greater of a man at the end of his life than it would have been if he would have just lived just this normal, regular life. You know, and, and we've all had tribulations and problems and persecution and things like that, and that shouldn't cause you to get down. That should motivate you and should bring you closer to God and just trust Him more that He will see you through. And at the end, you'll come forth as gold. You'll be that great, much greater of a Christian. You'll be a better soul winner. You know, use those times when you feel down, go soul winning. And then you'll have the joy of the Lord. Go, get, you know, and stop, it'll, it'll also take the, uh, you know, it'll take all of your, your concentration, if you will, off of yourself. And you'll start thinking about other people, and you'll see other people getting saved. And you'll start thinking about, hey, I got a lot going on for me, because well, I got all eternity in heaven. You know, so we should, we should take our affliction and use it to be fruitful. Just like we see Joseph here, it says, For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So you may be in the land of your affliction, but guess what? God can cause you to be fruitful as well. All of this is profitable for you. That's why these things are written down for us. It's profitable for you that, that it might you know, motivate or encourage you. And if you're going through an affliction, if you're going through a hard time, just remember, we serve the same God that Joseph served. You know what God did for him? He caused him to be fruitful. You know what God will do for you? He'll cause you to be fruitful. Look at verse 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Verse 54. And the seven years of dearth 
Like I mentioned, that's like death. It means famine. It's referring to a, a bad famine. Seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So notice God, I just smacked that fly finally. Notice that God made provision for everyone that was in the land of Egypt. It says, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. <clears throat> Verse 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, that means that they didn't have any food. It comes from the word famine, famished, right? They're all, they're hungry at this point, right? Uh, the, the, it implies that they're in a famine. They're very hungry. The people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Notice, what are they wanting? Bread. What did they put up? Corn, right? You can see this from the book of Ruth as well. There's a few different places. Actually, later on in the book of Genesis, you can prove this again, <clears throat> that corn is just grain. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. This goes back to how to get to the Father, you've got to go through the Son. He's like, I'm not talking to you. You know, what do the Jews say? Oh, you know, we worship, you know, supposedly God. Even That's what Christians really will say. That they don't believe there's a father and a son, right? The Jews wouldn't technically say that. But there are Christians that are like these major Judaizers who worship the Jews literally. They say they don't even need Jesus. John Hagee literally said we should not try to proselyte Jews. And he wants to act like he's a friend of the Jews. He doesn't love them. He hates them, my friend. He is damning them to hell. There are possibly people that believe the right gospel that heard that, that maybe didn't preach the gospel to a Jew because of that. That's horrible. That's super wicked. He's, he's saying, oh, you know, you don't need to proselyte them. You know, they have the Father. Do you know what the Father would say if he just tried to go straight to him? Go to Jesus. Just like they came to Pharaoh, you know what he said? Go to Joseph. Can't come to me. You've got to go through him. Right? Just like Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You want to get to Pharaoh? You've got to go through Joseph. You want the bread? Right? You've got to go through Joseph. You know what God the Father tells people? If somebody just prays to just Jehovah in general, I'm sorry, not saved. If they don't know the name of Jesus and they don't call upon the name of Jesus, not saved. Right. Not saved. There is one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ. You have to call upon the name of Jesus. Amen. You can't just say Lord. You can't just say God. You can't just say Jehovah. You have to, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're like, well, that just says the name of the Lord. Go back to verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's talking about Jesus. You have to pray to Jesus. God has ordained and appointed that he will receive all glory through the man Christ Jesus. It's the same one God, but it's referring specifically to himself while he was manifest in the flesh. That man, God as a man, was the one that paid for the sins of the whole world. And that's who you got to go through. You can't just go straight to you know, God the Father if you don't believe in Jesus. He, you know, he's the everlasting Father, alright? That's why. If you don't have the Father, you don't have the Son. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Because it's one person. Because it's the same. It's one God. It's one God. Right? And if you want to go to Pharaoh, if you want to go to God the Father, you got to go through Joseph or you got to go through Jesus, of course. If you want to go, if anybody wants to go to heaven, they want to go and they want to see the face of God, they got to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Look at verse 56. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. <clears throat> and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. So this is a grievous, grievous famine. I'm sure people still died. But he's, he's, he's opening this up now and he's selling it to them. Selling the bread to them. Look at verse 57. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. What does Egypt represent in the Bible? The world, right? There's a time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign over all the world. And that's what you have Joseph doing here. He's reigning over all of Egypt, which represents all the world. It's a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in the millennial reign. You know what they say? You know what the Bible says is going to happen? It says that all nations are going to come to him. 
This, that's what this picture is. All nations coming and bowing before the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's even in Zechariah uh, chapter number 12, it talks about how, how he, you know, anybody who doesn't come, any nation that doesn't come and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that they're going to they're gonna have a, a famine there. They're going to have famine. It says he's not going to have rain, right? So if they want bread, you better go to Joseph. If you want bread, you better go to Jesus. This is a picture of him reigning over all the world in the millennial kingdom. And notice, everybody comes. It says, and all, country, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore. It says, in all the lands. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this great chapter. We thank you for all the, the strong symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And always, everything points.